welcome to the Body Smart Book Club, where we talk about the best of what we've read. Today we're starting a new book. It's called Training for the Uphill Athlete, and we're super excited about it. Uh, before we start here, we thought we would each just tell a little bit about us and how we got into running. So, Preston, yeah. you want to tell yeah. us your story? I'll kick us off. Okay. Uh, so I started running in junior high, ultimately, on the track team. Um, it was more of like a supplement for soccer. I was a big soccer player. I loved playing soccer and I always wanted to play on the high school team. And so as I got through junior high and soccer tryouts approached for high school, I wanted to be in really good shape for soccer tryouts that winter. So I joined the cross country team and I thought that would be a good means for me to get in really good shape for that child's tryouts. But it kind of backfired when I fell in love with running and never even tried out for the soccer team. Um, <laughs> that's that's so no, I've been running ever since. I like, yeah, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Yeah. What's your story? So, so it's actually, I'm actually a lot newer to the um, to the running world. So it's just funny because for a year, like if you talked to my high school self and was like, oh, like Mark thinks running is 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 good, right? Like Mark Mark enjoys running. He sees good in it. That Mark would tell you like, no way, that Mark's a loser, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, I just, I, I didn't really see the benefit in it. And, and for a long time, I kind of avoided it in terms of aerobic exercise, just because a lot of ankle injuries in the past um, that made it kind of um, uncomfortable to, uh, to run. But I actually got some shoes that, um, <laughs> I'm not, I, yeah, usually my, my spill on, on shoes is, is find something that's comfortable for you and that works for you. Um, but found a pair of shoes that kind of limited the amount of motion that was going on in my ankle, um, made running a little bit easier, and it's just made it a lot more fun. Um, and I think just in, um, in just some of the influences I've had, you know, with, with Cameron and with being able to meet and talk with you guys and, and a lot of the books that we've read, that's just further reinforced um, my love of running and, and why uh, I think it's, everyone should, should, should run, right? I think that's um, not only from the, the physical and mental health benefits, but it's just, it's very accessible, right? Strap on a pair of shoes and, and get out on the trails or get out on the road. Um, you know, I think it's a it's very easy intro to aerobic exercise. Awesome. In a sense, easy in a sense. Well, yeah, yeah. it comes with a caveat. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, what about you, Molly? So, I guess I kind of started running in. Uh, junior high, every Friday we did the mile. Uh, oh, the dreaded gym class oh, mile. Whew. I hated that. I woke up with yes. a pit in my son the other day. <laughs> but I was really, like, I was a tomboy and I was really competitive. And I just kind of had this, like, internal, like, I have to beat everyone every Friday. <laughs> and um, and I beat all the girls and I pushed myself and I, I hated it, though. I hated it, but I just felt like I had to because just that's just how it was I guess and then when I went to high school people were like oh no you should try it for the track team and I was like no I thought running was over <laughs> but uh, I like gave it a peer pressure and I just kind of I joined the track team and I, I really enjoyed it but I mainly enjoyed hanging out with friends and I like being outside and I honestly never really liked track that much it wasn't until after I graduated high school and I I missed feeling good and being in shape and I started distance running because I I was a sprinter in high school. I felt weird. I can after I graduated, I can just go to the track and like sprint. I don't know. <laughs> so I was like, I guess I'll just run. So I started running and and when I didn't have anyone to compare myself to, when I was just running to run and I could just go at my own pace, I fell in love with it. I could just put my headphones in and it was kind of my therapy. And so that's that's kind of where it started for me, and I've just been on it ever since. So yeah, yeah. Something that I just I think that that's cool, kind of about all of our stories, is just the process of a change. Uh, the, or sorry, the, the process of change that involved. Right. Um, we all kind of approached running from a different bent. We all definitely started out with some different beliefs about about running, um, but like through our experience, right? Like we were able to change. And I, I think that's just like a cool thing. Um, the idea of, of being open to, to new ideas and new things and not becoming so dogmatic about one thing that you miss out on some of the great things that life has to experience or has to offer us, right? Some, some really neat experiences. And, um, you know, I'm no, by no means an, an amazing uh, runner, definitely not an elite runner like, like Preston over here. 
but um, I think it's just been cool to reflect back on that process of change that I've gone through over time and, and how my attitudes and beliefs and behaviors around running changed. Yeah. And I, I think it's really interesting too that none of us intended to be right. <laughs> All of us were like coming through something else, you being a sprinter, and you mentioned your story about if you were to ask yeah. younger Mark if he was uh, going to be a runner, they'd be. Oh, heck no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. This is PG fan. Where that came from. <laughs> yeah. He's really passionate about yes. running. Uh, and me being a soccer player, um, never, um, I remember like sitting around the dinner table talking to my parents, and they were talking about this guy that would end up being my coach later on, but he'd run a 100 mile trail race. And I was like, man, that guy's nuts. Like, that's something I will never do. Like, <laughs> why would someone want to do that in the first place? And, um, you know, we all kind of came from that same background of, you know, Similar that's not for me. Yeah. 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 So if you are thinking about getting into running or if you are running and you hate it, just keep running, keep trying, because one day you will, it's like a drug. You'll get addicted <laughs> to it and then you'll never be able to stop. <laughs> <laughs> um. So it's interesting, I, I want to tag on to the point you made there, right? Because there's some people that have been running for a long time and, and they hate it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's some deeper reasons behind that. Um, and one thing that I think we've all found is that uh, some of that uh, sometimes comes from kind of an improper approach to training um, and maybe a misunderstanding of, of why they're training and the underlying principles principles of, of what they're trying to accomplish in, in, in running. And so um, kind of with this intro episode of the book, especially where it goes a little bit more into the, to the science and more of the explanation of, of the training, which we love. It's super fun yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think kind of diving into that, um, we can find some of the reasons for, for why we're training, how to train, and how to make, maybe make it a little bit better so the training doesn't seem so daunting and such like a, like such a terrible thing. Um, because but, it isn't. <laughs> yeah, honestly, if it's miserable for you, you're not doing it right. If you do it the right way, then I think everyone can learn to love running. Yeah, yeah I agree. So, well, how about we jump into the book here? It's yeah. so funny, we never cool. know where the conversation is going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, in this episode, we're going to cover pages 23 to 51 in Training from Uphill Athletes. And this is all about the physiology of running. So, it does get pretty yeah. scientific and technical. Uh, we will try to make it fun. We'll get way too into it. Yeah. Mark, I almost <laughs> referred to myself in the third person. Mark might do that. in front of camera makes us do weird things. <laughs> so, anyways, we'll just dive on in here. Mark, you read a quote earlier that. Uh, yes. Yes. Like. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab that. My computer definitely just blacked out. So <laughs> there's gonna be a cut there. And... So I seriously don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> I have that urge to like talk to person. I'm gonna my camera and it's just like oh. that was hilarious. Like, like we said, make it for the camera. Yeah, I was like, oh my gosh. I hope you can like just scrub the sound. <laughs> 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 like, I think it was hilarious. That was hilarious. Oh my gosh. I'm not worried about that at all. Okay, <laughs> anyway. That. It just makes you more human. Oh yeah, well, it just makes for a great rock. Except we can't be friends because you swear. So. I know. <laughs> Don't swear in real life. Like, that came up on video. Oh, yeah, so oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Nice. I love that. Oh. <laughs> okay. okay. Anyways. Yes. Back to the quote. Or back to the quote. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so it, I think this is really very much the philosophy behind this book, and and um, maybe. It, it, it bears talking a little bit about how this book came to be. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the primary author is Killian Journey. That's I pronounced it right, right? Correct. Yeah, all right, good. Maybe you want to do that. Um, but just someone who's been in, like is just an all around endurance athlete, uh, kind of accidentally found his way into running, right? <laughs> kind, of, kind of the same experience, um, but um, really wanted to just throughout his training, throughout his life, has absorbed a lot of kind of the underlying principles of, of um, endurance training and uh, got together with a couple of, um, of physicians and, and the sports scientists to write this book, to dive into the science, um, to kind of explain the, the why for, for training. And so what he said in there, he said, blindly following any training scheme, 
without understanding the underlying process will handicap, if not undermine your, your performance. Um, and so, um, not that there is anything inherently wrong right, with following a training plan. I think we, you know, it's definitely a beneficial thing. We want to have training plans. We want to have that set up so we know what we're doing um, and, and when we're doing it. But I think that understanding the why um, can make it a lot easier to implement that training plan and to keep, keep with it consistently and to not make some of the common training errors that, that we see people make. For sure. So basically, the reason why all of this is important is so you have more tools to create the perfect training, well, a good training plan for you, because there's no such thing as one perfect training perfect plan for everyone. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We all have different adaptations and different, you know, physiological biomarkers, things like that, that yeah. uh, you kind of cater training plans towards. And so, if you know, if you're just pulling off one from the internet, then it's not going to be very general to what you need. And so if you understand kind of the science and the physiology that goes behind it, you may be able to adapt that a little bit more towards yourself. Um, and it's really encouraging to see that coming from someone like Killian Jornet as well, um, just because of how great of an athlete he is. I mean, uh, when it comes to skiing, um, outdoor adventures, running, anything like that, um, he's always going to be in the conversation as one of the best in the world. And seeing someone like that um, share his knowledge with us is, is really exciting and we can't wait to dive into that as well. For sure. And just a little side note, starting out with the training plan is a good way to start if you don't really know where to start and then over time you can adapt yeah. and tweak that plan to what is going to fit. Okay, so another quote that uh, we found in the book that we really liked was this one. Uh, so he says, the more you train a certain way within your ability to absorb the work, the more adaptation you will cause. So we really liked his little insert of within your ability to absorb the work. Because if you're training in a certain way, but you're overtraining, all you're doing is hurting your body. You need to train within appropriate limits. And it made me think of well, my dad always told me when you're a kid, practice doesn't make perfect, perfect practice makes perfect. And I feel like it's kind of a similar concept where you need to practice the right way to develop the right habits. Definitely. So I just, I'm, I'm just really passionate. Well, I mean, we're all passionate about that, right? <laughs> yeah, but especially that's why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> no. For sure. Um, so, so let's, uh, I guess, dive into to one of the core ideas in this chapter, um, and that was of the, the endurance tripod. Yeah. Um, so you want to talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Endurance tripod is basically talking about the three things that we can do to ourselves and our training to be able to improve um, what we do, whether it be running or skiing um, or whatever sport it is. And so they talk about your VO2 max. They talk about your movement economy, and they talk about your lactate, thre lactate threshold. Um, and those are all things that, for the most part, we can um, change and improve in ourselves. The VO2 max is, you know, a little bit more solidified. It's more of like a genetic thing, but uh, mm -hmm. those other two especially are things that we can always be adapting our training plans to, to be able to improve um, and make ourselves better athletes. Yeah. For sure. And so just quick definitions of everything for for new runners or um, <laughs> people who don't know. That's what I'm saying. Or people that just like reading the dictionary. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you may be out there. I don't know. So, so <laughs> this section's for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So your real to max is like, have you seen the movies, the athlete who's running on the treadmill with the mask on his face, right? They're getting their VO2 max. And that, that basically is the max oxygen you can uptake uh, during an intense exercise. And something that he mentioned in the book is this is a really helpful number, especially for amateur athletes who can make really big improvements and change that VO2 number. But it's kind of different once once you become an elite athlete, that number doesn't matter as much. Do you want to talk a little bit yeah, about that? Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, I think too often we equate um, like VO2 max of like, oh, if I have the highest VO2 max, right? Like I'm, I'm a peak performer, I'm better than everyone else. Um, and and I, it really isn't the ultimate like end all be all of endurance. There's definitely some other things that are, are more trainable um, and that probably ultimately affect our, our performance more than VO2 max. So, so VO2 max really talks more to our, um, our potential, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
kind of in the idea of of like uh, kind of comparing a, a V8 engine, I guess, to maybe like a four cylinder engine, right? Like ultimately it's a bigger engine, but um, you have to have the gas in there. You know, you have to have the parts moving right. You have to have everything else combined in there for it to reach its potential of, of getting that top acceleration and those and those top speeds. Um, yeah, yeah. And, oh, here we go. Oh, I was just, yeah. yeah, I was just saying. Like, <laughs> I mean, if you don't have wheels on your car and you have this V8 engine, you're not going to beat the, the four cylinder. It doesn't really matter. Yeah, like if you don't have legs, you so. won't overrun. So. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. And so I, I think. Um, you know, there's definitely things that we can do to raise our VO2 max, and, and especially in, in more novice athletes, it's, it's more trainable um, and maybe more of a factor than, than what you're seeing in, in elite VO2, or elite VO2 athletes, in elite endurance athletes, um, where, where, so, where uh, you know, over years of training, maybe that stays the same, or it even declines sometime, but there's other factors, right? That movement economy, that lactate threshold, um, that can be played around with um, that actually improve their performance. So even though, you know, maybe this top athlete has the same VO2 max for year after year after year, their performance continues to improve because they've trained these other aspects. Um, and so I think not looking at VO2 max is the end all be all for aerobic fitness, um, but making sure that we're paying attention to those other areas of the tripod. Um, because if we're taking one of those legs away or we're not focusing on, on you know, any of those legs, um, it's going to become unbalanced and, and ultimately it's to our detriment. Yeah, for sure. I wouldn't, whenever I have talked to athletes about VO2 max testing and things like that, I always get two different responses. You know, it can have two different effects on people. Um, you can have the outlook like, oh, I can get it tested. And what if I get like a really low number? It can be like a very negative thing on somebody. Because um, it is, it's talking about your potential. It's not talking about where you are at that moment. Um, and so, Throughout the book, you know, it talks about not putting a lot of weight into that number. Um, and I think that's important because I think the biggest factor when it comes to potential is going to be how much you're willing to work. Um, and so while it can be a good physiological sign that you have a lot of talent and a lot of ability, um, don't let that number affect your mindset towards your training because um, there's so many other things you can be doing to become a good athlete. That's a, yeah, that's great. That's really great to uh, <laughs> focus on that number. Um, so that's that's VO2 max. That's one stand of the endurance tripod. Uh, another stand of the endurance tripod is movement economy. And we're kind of using car analogies here. Yeah. He, in the book, he also used car analogies. Movement economy is really similar to uh, fuel economy. So movement economy is basically um, how much energy it costs you to move. So there's gonna be some movements like, like for me, I bounce up and down a lot when I run. That's wasted energy this way when I could be using that energy in this way, right? Um, one analogy that we used in the 8020 episode a while ago is, let's say you have uh, 10 gases and you can use 10 gases to go <laughs> 10 miles. Once you improve your movement economy, you can use 10 gases to go 20 miles, or maybe it only takes you five gases to go 10 miles, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So just really improving the, the efficiency of that system. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's a couple different components to that movement efficient, efficiency. Um, one is kind of the, the mechanical aspect, right? Mm -hmm. What does our form look like? Um, you know, how will we maybe losing some efficiency in, in how I run and, and how can we gain some efficiency. Um, and, and again, we brought this up in other episodes. We don't want to focus too much on like, you have to get this perfect form. Um, so much, uh, I think, of that form comes from just putting in the miles and, and making sure that we're not having any like big errors, right? Like, you don't want someone to just run like this, right? Like, <laughs> that's going to be... <laughs> That's right. Like, that is very inefficient, right? And that's that's, that's going to cause some problems. Maybe some legal problems too. They might want to. We need to cut that guy. Um. <laughs> There's this uh, video on Facebook where it was like different running forms, and it's like like the the, oh, the prancer, oh, yeah. the, the prancer, and the the speed walker. It's really funny. <laughs> so true. Yeah. To our patrons, but, but, but I think it's important, right? Because there are like a variety of different forms that kind of fall in that spectrum, right? And so there's there's um, kind of a set of, of things that we look at that that tend to con uh, to tend to define some of the elite runners. Um, but that's not, 
I think what, what has kind of been borne out in, in you know, years of looking at athletes and, and diving in science and looking at research is that less of training those specific movements and that many of those specific movements come as a result of putting in the hours and putting in the miles into training and just the body um, kind of naturally gets into that. Uh, what was it that uh, Matt Fitzgerald called it? The relaxed smooth ease, mm -hmm. right? Um, we just, over time, we kind of naturally um, adopt some of those, some of those patterns. Um, uh, and so, that, you know, I, I think that just kind of comes as, as we put in those miles, as we put in that time of training. The other side is the metabolic efficiency, right? How are we using those uh, energy systems? How are we causing adaptations in them um, so that we get the most um, efficiency out of, out of, um, out of the, the energy that, that we intake? Awesome. The third stand of the endurance tripod is the lactate threshold, and we're really excited about this one. This is basically what the rest of the pages cover. Um, this is the best predictor of endurance performance. So if you're familiar with the five zone system, the lactate threshold is when you're in zone four, zone five. This is when you're sprinting, and this is uh, an effort that you can only sustain for a couple minutes, and this is when you're going to have a lot of lactate buildup. Yeah, yeah. And so when when we're talking about the lactate threshold and, and training that and improving that, we're really uh, talking about let's Im improve our energy pathways, right? Diving into to our metabolism and how do we adapt our body um, and how do we use our body systems um, or how to train those body systems rather. Um, to, to increase our, our aerobic performance and, and aerobic capacity. Um, and so, so really it's, it's that split between the aerobic system and the anaerobic system, um, where the aerobic system is producing about 17 times as much energy as the anaerobic system. And so that's definitely gonna be the one that, that, we, that we wanna hit, that we really wanna train and, and help our bodies to, to really um, make those positive adaptations that increases that that uh, the usage of that aerobic system, but without neglecting the anaerobic system, because there's some really important adaptations that, that we can hit um, that, that also ultimately um, kind of play with that lactate threshold and, and improve our, our ceiling, if you will. In talking about these two systems, um, let me just introduce a term before I, I do that. And it's one that we've talked about in previous episodes. Um, that's really the foundation of Matt Fitzgerald's 20 running. Um, Mark Sisson talked about it too. And um, it's become a big emphasis in, in the running world for, for good reasons, um, because it's, it's important. So that's the concept of polarized training, um, that, that we have our high intensity training, and our low intensity training, um, and we're focusing on those and, and not including a lot of the moderate intensity training, um, mm -hmm. because there's some really positive adaptations that we get from that more of that low intensity and more of that high intensity. So first let's talk about that, that aerobic system. Um, and so there, what we really want to focus on is that low intensity, long duration of training. And the reason that we want to focus on that is because um, it provides the stimulus um, for our cells to create, uh, for, those, for those slow twitch fibers, right, for those muscle cells um, to produce more mitochondria, which ultimately means um, an increased aerobic capacity, right? It can process um, more, uh, more of that energy that's, that's coming in. Um, and that's called metacognitional biogenesis. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, that's a word. Right? Metacognitional <laughs> biogenesis. Um, and so, so, right. So that, that, that long, slow, um, training, right. Lower intensity, um, is, is necessary to cause those adaptations. It's not going to occur to the same degree if we're doing a lot of moderate intensity or just hitting all of our sessions high. Um, and really about 80% of our training overall, um, we want to keep in that, in that low intensity zone. Um, obviously along the training season, there's going to be some kind of different changes and maybe that would play with that, um, volume a little bit, but overall that, that kind of 80% we want low intensity to create those adaptations to really build out a strong and big aerobic base that we can build off of. Um, now talking about the anaerobic system, um, that one. We, uh, you know, we really want to train through that high intensity, uh, through those high intensity workouts. Mm -hmm. And this is where that lactate threshold, right? Kind of that ceiling, um, this is what raises that. And so that, so high intensity exercise is going to create a lot of those metabolic byproducts um, that kind of send a signal to the brain to induce fatigue and to slow us down. 
Um, and so our cells, our, our muscle cells need that stimulus saying, oh my gosh, I have all this byproduct and I don't know what to do with it. I need to get more workers so I can shovel this to other areas that can, that can use this energy source. Um, and so liver, uh, skeletal muscles, heart can use that lactate that's created as a metabolic byproduct um, for, for energy as well. And so when we induce that high intensity training, it's, it's really a, a signal to our cells to bring in more workers so that we can better shovel that, that lactate um, out of the cell and, and, and to where it, it can be uh, better used. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so taking both those ideas together, I love this concept in, in, in the book. Um, I actually, you know, I love it so much. I'm gonna show the picture because I thought it was so cool. Um, it's a great picture. It is, it is. The idea of building a, a, a lactate vacuum mm -hmm. um, or building a bigger vacuum, right? A, better, a, a bigger, metabolic vacuum and so that's the picture the weird vacuum made out of, out of muscles so this is the slow twitch muscles sucking up all the pyruvate out of the fast twitch muscles so you know that lactate yeah exactly and so um what you're doing by training those aerobic fibers right uh by increasing the number of mitochondria the you're you're making a bigger vacuum they can suck up more of that lactate that's produced more primarily in the fast twitch fibers, they have less, um, they have fewer mitochondria um, and tend to use that glycolytic pathway a lot more. Um, so that bigger vacuum can suck up more. Um, and then when we train that anaerobic side, um, we really increase the, the power of that vacuum, right? There's a lot more suction it can, can give in, 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 in essence. I don't know if suction's right word to use. It can just, it can, I guess, pick up a lot more at, at, at a given time, right? It can shovel more across um, across those membranes to, to get that energy out of there. And so um, ultimately we end up with a bigger and a more powerful vacuum by training both the aerobic and the anaerobic systems. Uh, yeah. So, so I have a question for you. How big is your vacuum? <laughs> hey! <laughs> okay, well, that was a, a great uh, summary of the, of the last bit there. Um, let's hop into questions that people sent us every week. Oh, did Wait, you wanna... we can't forget about the athlete story. So, oh, yeah, yeah, so this is, that. yeah, yeah. So this is like, I, we love this book. It's, it's such it's a phenomenal awesome. book. It's amazing. So if you it's, haven't bought it, go buy it. Go yes. buy it, read them. It's awesome. And give them to your friends. Yeah. So the book has these really beautiful vignettes. Um, athletes just telling their stories and, and some of their experience with training over the years. Um, and, and the one, it was a Janelle, Janelle Smiley, I think was her name. Um, in the book, we'll go with that, Janelle Smiley. What a, what a great name, what a happy name, right? Yes. <laughs> um, but this story was like so, so cool for me, um, just in how big her mindset was in, in changing her approach to training. And that's what you brought up at the beginning of the episode, uh, Preston, is is how that mindset can affect us um, for, for good or for bad. So she was actually the, oh, what, how many put it? She was the first lady to... She was the first woman to ski across the Alps. Yeah, like what an accomplishment. Holy moly. And how long did it take her? Like 36 six, days. Yeah. I don't know why I know that exact number, but and I do. Said, that, that stuck out for me. She <laughs> said it's about 35 miles and like 8,000 feet of climbing every day. Yeah, yeah. It was, two days. It was oh intense. God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the really think, cool things that she said is that initially I approached it um, from from curio a, a, a curiosity standpoint. I wanted to, I wondered if I could do it, um, and as I went through that journey, um, it changed into uh, a belief that I could do it, and she did do it. And so I think that's so cool. Um, and and maybe if that's where you're starting with running, right, is is maybe running for me can i do it is that is that something that i want to try and that as you put in the time as you put in, in, in the work and, and make the effort that you'll find that you can do it um that it's something that's beneficial for you and i think being able to have that curiosity turn into to belief turn into action is a really really great principle um and and uh, i just kind of going with the idea of of keeping with it and, and pursuing um, new things uh, and, and learning and growing. I love that. 
one of my philosophies is keep moving. And I feel like this story was a perfect example of that. When it got hard, she just kept moving. And I think that's something that we all should do when it gets hard, when it sucks, when we don't know if we can do it anymore, just keep moving and you'll get there eventually. So that, yeah, that was an awesome, awesome story. Or like Dory said, just keep swimming. Yeah. Just keep swimming. <laughs> <I love that. laughs> Okay, well, well, anything else you guys want to add before we jump into our questions here? Um, drink milk, it does a god body good. It's not a <laughs> multi-commercial. No, I just, I think, I think that sums it up. Um, okay. Well, awesome. Well, we'll jump into, we just got a couple questions here. So first question that we received was, what are some real life applications? How can we apply what we learned in these pages to real life? And do an answer on this. We should like kind of introduce like a segment a little bit. It's, it's a new thing we're going to be doing. Yeah. 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 Uh, about how to introduce what our goal is here. So essentially what we're doing is we're going to, in every single episode we do, we're going to have a question segment where you guys can submit questions either to us um, by email um, Facebook. Facebook, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little video. Either mm -hmm. of those work. Yeah. Um, and then we can kind of personalize some of the content we get from the book for you guys. We want to get you guys more involved um, and be able to better use our expertise to help you guys. Um, sure. and, and, yeah. and if it's questions about what you read, ask us those. If it's questions from this episode, we can answer that in the next episode yeah. as well. Or even just running in general, you know, or, or whatever your, your sport is that you do. Um, we'd love to address some of those and be able to incorporate that into what we're talking about. Definitely, definitely. yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Thank you. So yeah, I mean, like Melody had said, you know, our first question that we received was talking about real life applications of some of these things that we did. Um, and for me, you know, I work more with athletes one-on-one -on -one that way. And so uh, it kind of fell into my, my realm of expertise, <laughs> I guess there, but, uh, Essentially, when you're talking about you know this tripod, this endurance tripod, and these um, three different um, it factors that really build out who you are as an athlete, um, you want to be able to find exercises and ways that you do these things in real life. They're going to play each one and be able to grow each one because as an athlete, um, you may have heard the um, bigger the base, the bigger the peak um, when you're training, and so as you are training and building these different energy systems, um, the more you're able to expand um, and polarize your training, the higher you're going to be able to get. And so um, be able to address both your anaerobic and aerobic systems um, by doing speed workouts in your running or make sure it's easy to run, stay easy, um, incorporating lifting and not just uh, lifting lots of repetitions and sets, but really focus on lifting heavy. So you're getting that polarized training there as well. Yeah. Um, I like a quote that came from our previous book by Mark Sisson, that uh, if you're going to lift light, um, you might as well go for a five mile run. Because <laughs> um, it really is, you're doing the same thing. You're just doing these cons consistent reps over and over and over and over again, and you're training the same energy system. Um, and so when it comes down to it, you're not developing that lactate threshold that we talked about. Um, you're not developing your VO2 max. You're not developing your movement economy. Um, and so really polarizing your training, not just in a running sense, but really in your lifting as well, um, in your recovery as well, making sure that you're getting adequate, adequate amount of sleep um, and utilizing different modalities that you have to be able to really have a holistic, well-rounded training, uh, training plan. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank, thank you. Questions. Thank you for bringing in strength training. Oh my gosh. Yes. Thank you. It's going to be in every episode. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That will be my accountability. Is I'll make sure someone's <laughs> strength training in every single episode. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. It's it's for sure that runners don't incorporate strength training as much as they should. Yeah. So, again, yeah. thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. No, it's yeah, just listen. Yeah. Listen to Preston. Listen to Preston. He knows all. So our next question is, this is for the nerds out there who like really got into the specifics of this chapter. What is the difference between lactic acid and lactate? Yeah. Because the two terms are used interchangeably, right? So we'll, we'll try to do this quick and not get too techy. But basically what happens is um, the end product of anaerobic metabolism is pyruvate. And if all the mitochondria are overwhelmed with pyruvate, they're not gonna be able to take in more pyruvate, 
pyruvate, and that's when you uh, you get your lactate buildup. But what happens is um, instead of the pyruvate going into the mitochondria, the pyruvate is broken down into lactate and a hydrogen ion. So basically, uh, lact or it's broken down into that's right, yeah, lactate and a hydrogen ion. So basically, lactic acid is lactate with a hydrogen ion, and lactate is lactic acid without a hydrogen ion. Yeah, so yes. Did you explain that, that was right? great. Okay. And so the, I think that's, I mean, it's kind of a nerdy question, yeah, but like lactic acid is a, th a, a term that gets thrown around a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I got all the lactic acid in my muscles, and like, that's no. why I can't move. That's, no. that's not actually, that's not actually what's happening. Because um, like you said, right, the, the pyruvate sits there and then when lactic acid gets created, it immediately dissociates into those two. Mm -hmm. um, but when we've, again, kind of going back to that lactate threat, that lactate shuttle idea um, is that when we've improved that system, um, it's able to get the, the lactate out of the cell to be used for energy. Um, and, and some of those hydrogen ions that would normally increase the acidity of the cell and kind of throw off that acid-based balance, right? decrease the homeostasis of the, of the cell, um, that can be used in, in some of those cycles and those metabolic pathways as well, so that we're not getting a buildup of that. Um, but yes, thank you for creating that point. That's like a that's like a weird thing for me, is when people are just like talking about lactic acid buildup, that's not actually what's happening. I just see like happening. at a restaurant, there's like people talk about, man, it's like lactic acid, and I see just like fuming. Yeah, I know. It's like, we're not about to tell them straight. Yeah, yeah. Let me tell <laughs> so, okay, well, awesome, guys. Well, thank you for submitting those questions and look forward to uh, the questions from this video and from the reading next week, and I can't wait to answer them next week. Okay, so quick shout out to our sponsors. Uh, thank you to Jimmy Thomas, to Willa Race Series. Thank you to the Utah Running Shop. Thank you to the Facebook page, Run for Fun. And thank you to the Wasatch Run Club. Yeah, Wasatch Run Club. Meeting every Wednesday night to go run up in the mountains. Check us out on Facebook or on our website, www.wasatchrunclub.com. All right, yeah. awesome. And thank you to food for existing. Yes. Thank you, food. <laughs> 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 okay, we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you.